a formula for having crucial conversations. Conversations like the one Marilyn Tam had with Phil Knight are definitely uncomfortable and difficult, but the people who master the art of these difficult but crucial conversations are the ones who advance the furthest in their careers. If you need to have a crucial conversation, the kind where emotions run high and opinions vary greatly, there are some guidelines that can help you. The first one is to stop scaring yourself in advance of the conversation by escalating the actual facts into something truly frightening. Most people presuppose what the other party will do when they hear about the matter. This process of telling ourselves a story and attaching feelings to what's happened takes mere nanoseconds. If you need to have a crucial conversation, but stop yourself by saying, I'm afraid of how they'll react, or I don't know how to begin, realize that the issue you're failing to address is probably not going to go away, no matter how much you ignore it. In these situations, it's helpful to have a formula that not only steps you through the conversation, but also helps both of you determine a solution. 1. To begin, determine your motivation for having the conversation, whether it's merely to express yourself and get something off your chest, or to eventually solve a problem. 2. Make sure to schedule enough time to have the conversation. 3. Plan your conversation in advance by crafting a clear message that keeps you on track. Start with the facts of what actually happened or is happening versus the story you may have made up in your head. How will you report the facts of the situation? Be sure to separate the actual facts and the feelings you've attached to the situation or the event. 4. After reporting the facts, ask the other person, How do you see this? What do they think the impact is? Oftentimes we presuppose or imagine some horrible reaction or consequence without knowing what the other person's actual experience of the situation is. 5. Ask the other party what they would like to do to resolve the matter, if in fact you are looking for resolution. Sometimes simply expressing yourself might be your goal. 6. If you decide to resolve the issue, agree on and document what actions you will both take, by when you will take them, and how you will follow up with each other. Overcoming the Fear of Judgment Sometimes we don't tell the truth faster because we're afraid of being judged by others. We think we're not good enough, that our opinions are odd, or that something very real is wrong with us. So we don't divulge what's going on, explain why we can't participate, admit how we messed up, reveal why we can't donate, or express how our viewpoint is simply different. Perhaps we've even been judged previously after tentatively offering an explanation, so we hesitate to open ourselves up to judgment again. Unfortunately, this kind of withholding takes up a lot of energy. It requires us to monitor our conversations, plan all our actions, remember who was told what, and constantly formulate polite explanations for our situation. Imagine instead the freedom of simply stating your reasons and moving on. That kind of self-confidence is powerful and impressive, and few people will judge you for that kind of forthrightness. When Charlie Collins was nine years old, he was diagnosed with macular degeneration. By the age of thirteen, he was declared legally blind. As a result of being unable to see anything but dim shapes, colors, and areas of light, Charlie struggled through high school, tried college but flunked out twice, and started drinking and taking drugs. After moving back in with his parents and working a series of whatever odd jobs he could get, Charlie eventually started his own company, Vision Dynamics, which supplies products and services to people living with low vision blindness so they can lead independent and happy lives. But even with his ensuing business success and successful marriage, Charlie had low self-esteem and still considered himself that dumb blind guy. Looking to boost his self-esteem, Charlie found my audio album Maximum Confidence on the Internet. Later, he discovered two of my audiobooks, The Aladdin Factor and The Power of Focus. For the next two years, he listened to the audio tapes over and over. That's when he decided to attend a three-day seminar with me. Here's the rest of the story in his words. 
I was so impressed with what I was learning from Jack Canfield that in early 2008, I found myself sitting in the first row at a three-day seminar, hearing the man speak live. A few weeks earlier, when I'd registered for the program, I hadn't told anyone I was vision impaired. Now, surrounded by more than 300 smart, successful people, I tried to hide my disability. I thought these people might feel sorry for me or look down on me. It wasn't a problem at first. I took copious notes, writing with a big black sharpie, the only way I could see what I was writing, until the lady to my right asked me to please use a different pen, because the fumes from the sharpie were bothering her. I didn't want to tell her why I needed to use that particular type of pen, so I took out a ballpoint pen and pretended to use it. The next day, the hiding thing came to a head. I arrived for the morning meeting and saw our name badges laid out on a table outside the door. I couldn't see the writing on them at all. I looked around to make sure no one was watching me, then bent down with my nose an inch from the badges, trying to find mine, and straightened up whenever I heard someone approach, which was every thirty seconds or so. After a few minutes of this, I was panicked, ready to run back to my hotel room, skip the meeting, and hide until it was time for my flight back to Connecticut. The doors were about to close when I had an idea. The next person who walked up to the table was a woman. Excuse me, I said. I left my glasses in my room. My name's Charlie. Can you point out my badge to me? She smiled and handed it to me. I thanked her, my heart pounding, and sprinted into the meeting room. At the first break, I walked up to the stage and introduced myself to Jack. We began talking, and for some reason, I told him about my experience with the name badges. After the break, I sat down in my chair, ready for more, when I heard Jack say, Somebody please give Charlie the microphone. Then he asked me to stand up. Hi, Charlie, Jack said. I want you to take a look around at all the people in the room. Now tell them what you told me at the break. I was angry. How could he expose me like that? How could he make me tell everyone my secret? But I did it. And as I spoke, I could feel more and more power flowing inside me. At the end of my story, people clapped. Jack said, So, Charlie, I think you get it. You need to stop living your life this way. As of right now, you are no longer going to allow that legal blindness to run your life. Then he looked around the room and asked, Is there anybody here who would say no if Charlie approached them and asked for help? The room went nuts. Everyone was calling out, I'd help him. I'd love to help. Of course I'd help him. Jack continued, Human beings like to help each other. That's what we're here for, to serve and help each other. And all of us need help at certain times. All you have to do is tell the truth and ask. Now, do you believe that, Charlie? To my surprise, I did. For the rest of the seminar, Charlie had a great time. While he felt somewhat vulnerable, he also was more open, authentic, and empowered than he'd ever been before. His transformation eventually led Charlie to what he believes is his true calling, being a motivational speaker who inspires others to look beyond life's challenges. At the same time that his company sells items that make life easier for people with impaired vision, Charlie himself is able to inspire and empower them through personal growth workshops and classes, a unique approach that has helped his business flourish year after year. Also, Charlie travels around the country talking to groups who are both sighted and blind about how we can all overcome our blind spots. Thanks to telling the truth faster, he is living his authentic life purpose, teaching people how to genuinely see again. Principle 51. Speak with impeccability. Impeccability of the word can lead you to personal freedom, to huge success and abundance. It can take away all fear and transform it into joy and love. Don Miguel Ruiz author of The Four Agreements. For most of us, our words are spoken without consciousness. We rarely stop to think about what we are saying. 
Our thoughts, opinions, judgments, and beliefs roll off our tongues without a care for the damage or the benefits they can produce. Successful people, on the other hand, are the master of their words. They know that if they don't take dominion over their words, their words will take dominion over them. They're conscious of the thoughts they think and the words they speak, both about themselves and others. They know that to be more successful, they need to speak words that will build self-esteem and self-confidence, build relationships and build dreams. Words of affirmation, encouragement, appreciation, love, acceptance, possibility, and vision. To speak with impeccability is to speak from your highest self. It means that you speak with intention and with integrity. It means that your words are in alignment with what you say you want to produce, your vision and your dreams. Your word has power. When you speak with impeccability, your words have power not only with yourself, but also with others. To speak with impeccability is to speak only words that are true, that uplift, and that affirm other people's worth. As you learn how to speak with impeccability, you'll discover that words are also the basis of all relationships. How I speak to you and about you determines the quality of our relationship. What you say to others creates a ripple effect in the world. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 29, King James Version of the Bible Successful people speak words of inclusion rather than words of separation, words of acceptance rather than words of rejection, and words of tolerance rather than words of prejudice. If I express love and acceptance to you, you will experience love for me. If I express judgment and contempt for you, you will judge me back. If I express gratitude and appreciation for you, you will express gratitude and appreciation back to me. If I express words of hatred toward you, you will most likely hate me back. The truth is, your words put out a certain energy or message that creates a reaction in others a reaction that is usually returned to you multiplied. If you are rude, impatient, arrogant, or hostile, you can expect negative conduct to be returned to you. Everything you say produces an effect in the world. Everything you say to someone else produces an effect in that person. Know that you are constantly creating something, either positive or negative, with your words. Always ask yourself, is what I am about to say going to advance the cause of my vision, mission, and goals? Will it uplift the hearer? Will it inspire, motivate, and create forward momentum? Will it dissolve fear and create safety and trust? Will it build self-esteem, self-confidence, and a willingness to risk and take action? If not, find words that will or keep silent. Stop lying. As with negative conduct, when you lie, you not only separate yourself from your higher self, but you also run the risk of being found out and eroding others' trust even more. With the Chicken Soup for the Soul series, we had a policy that except for poems and stories that are clearly parables or fables, all the stories we print in Chicken Soup books were true. This is important to us because if the story is inspiring— we want readers to be able to say, if they can do it, then I can do it too. Occasionally, we found out that a contributor had fabricated a story, simply made it up. Every time we learned that, we ended up not using any more of that writer's stories. We no longer trusted such writers. Their word was no longer impeccable. In reality, lying is the product of low self-esteem the belief that you and your abilities are somehow not enough to get what you want. It is also based on the false belief that you can't handle the consequences of people knowing the truth about you, which is simply another way of saying, I am not enough. What you say about others matters even more. If we look back through history, all the world's highest and most respected beings and spiritual teachers have warned us against gossip and judgment of others. 
It's because they knew how damaging untruth really is. Wars have been started over words. People have been killed because of words. Deals have been lost because of words. Marriages have been destroyed because of words. Not only that, but gossip and judgment affect you, too, because you end up releasing a poison into the river of energy that is set up to bring you that which you truly want. When you speak ill of another to someone else, it may temporarily bond you to that person, but it creates a lasting impression in the other that you are the kind of person who gossips negatively about others. That other person will always be wondering, even if unconsciously, when will you turn that verbal poison against them? It will erode their sense of deep trust in you. Even without any words being spoken, others can pick up your negative, judgmental, and critical energy toward them. Then what you say about others has a way of finding its way back to the person who you are talking about. Many times people who care about me will call to say that someone I know has said something negative about me. What does that have to do with my relationship with them? It creates a subtle crack. Additionally, I have had to learn the hard way that when I gossip about another person, it, one, brings me down in the moment, two, focuses my attention on what I don't want in my life rather than creating more of what I do want, and three, literally wastes my breath. I've learned that I could be using my mental and verbal powers to create more of what I do want by focusing the power of my words on abundance instead. To speak with more impeccability when addressing others, make a commitment to be impeccable in your speech when talking to others. Make an effort to appreciate something about every person you interact with. Look for their positive aspects. Make a commitment to tell the truth as best you can in all your interactions and dealings with others. Make a commitment to do it for one day, then two days in a row, then a whole week. If you falter, start over. Keep building that muscle. Make it the intention of every interaction with others that you uplift them in some small way. Notice how you feel when you do that. Often, we use words in a damaging way not because we are bad people, but simply because we are not paying attention. No one ever taught us how powerful words really are. Idle Gossip I learned how powerful idle gossip is during my first year of teaching high school. On the first day of school, I walked into the teacher's lounge before school started. One of the older teachers approached me and said, I see you have Devin James in your American history class. I had him last year. He is a real terror. Good luck. You can imagine what happened when I walked into the class and saw Devin James. I was examining his every move. I was waiting for him to show signs of the terror he was promised to be. Devin didn't have a chance. He was already typecast. I already had an image of him before he ever opened his mouth. No doubt, I was even sending him a sort of unconscious signal. I know you are a troublemaker. That is the definition of prejudice prejudging a person before you ever really get a chance to know them. I learned never to let another teacher, or anyone for that matter, tell me what someone else was going to be like before I met the person. I learned to rely on my own observations. I also learned that if I treated all people with respect and signaled them through my speech and actions that I had high expectations for them, they almost always lived up to that positive expectation. The biggest cause of gossiping, of course, is that it robs you of a clear mind. People who are impeccable see the world more clearly. They think more clearly, and thus can be more effective in their decisions and actions. In The Four Agreements, Don Miguel Ruiz likens the process of gossiping to releasing a computer virus in your mind, causing it to think a little less clearly every time. Here are some practical ways to stop yourself and discourage others from gossiping. 1. Change the subject. 2. Say something positive about the other person. 3. Walk away from the conversation. 4. Keep quiet. 5. Clearly state that you no longer want to participate in gossiping about others. 
Check your thoughts and your feelings. How do you know when you have been impeccable with your word? When you feel good, happy, joyful, calm, and at peace. If you're not feeling these things, check your thoughts, your self-talk, and your verbal and written communication with others. When you begin to be more impeccable with your word, you will begin to see changes happening in all areas of your life. Principle 52 When in doubt, check it out. There may be some substitute for hard facts, but if there is, I have no idea what it can be. J. Paul Getty, one of the richest men in America and author of How to Be Rich. Too many people waste valuable time and precious resources wondering what other people are thinking, intending, or doing. Rather than just asking them for clarification, they make assumptions, usually assuming against themselves, and then make decisions based on those assumptions. Successful people, on the other hand, don't waste time assuming or wondering. They simply check it out. I'm wondering if, or, would it be okay to, or, are you feeling... They are not afraid of rejection, so they ask. People always imagine the worst when they don't know what is true. What's the fundamental problem with assuming anything? It's that people are usually the most afraid of that which they don't know. Instead of checking into things, they assume facts that may not exist, then build prejudices around those assumptions. They make bad decisions based on these assumptions, on rumors, or on other people's opinions. Consider the difference when you know all the facts, the actual facts, about a situation, person, problem, or opportunity. Then you can make decisions and take actions on the basis of what is real, rather than what you are making up. I remember a seminar I once conducted where one attendee, sitting in the back of the room, looked like he just didn't want to be there. He looked hostile and withdrawn. He had his arms crossed over his chest. He had what looked like a permanent scowl on his face and looked like he hated everything I had to say. I knew if I wasn't careful, I'd end up focusing on him and his apparent hostility to the detriment of everyone else in the room. As you can imagine, no speaker wants to hear that an audience member was forced to come to the seminar by his boss, or that he is unhappy with the material, or, even worse, that he dislikes the speaker himself. Given this participant's body language, it would have been easy to assume one of these things to be the case. Instead, I checked it out. I approached him during the first break and said, I can't help but notice you don't look like you're in a really good space. I was wondering if maybe the workshop's not working for you, or maybe you were sent here by your boss against your will and you really don't want to be here. I'm just really concerned. At that point, his entire demeanor shifted. He said, Oh, no, I'm loving everything you're saying. But I feel like I'm coming down with the flu. I didn't want to stay home and miss this because I knew how good it would be. It's taking every ounce of my concentration just to be here, but it's worth it because I'm getting so much out of it. Wow. If I hadn't asked, I could have ruined my whole day assuming the worst. How many times do you make assumptions, good or bad, without checking them out? Do you assume, without checking, when a special project is due, that all parties will deliver on time? Do you assume, without checking, that what you're providing is what everybody needs? Do you assume, without checking, at the end of a meeting that everyone is clear on who is responsible for getting which action items done by which date? Imagine how much easier it would be to not assume, and instead say, John, you're going to complete the report by next Friday, right? And Mary, you're going to get a quote from the printer by Tuesday at 5, right? We usually hesitate the most when it might be bad news. It's usually when we assume the worst that we don't want to check it out. We're simply afraid of what the answer might be. If I arrive home from work and my wife has a scowl on her face, it's easy to assume that she's mad at me. And though I could start walking around on tiptoes, 
thinking I've done something wrong and anticipating a blow-up. Imagine how much better it would be for our relationship if I simply said, You don't look happy. What's going on? The moment you begin to check it out, two things happen. First, you find out the real facts. Did you really do something wrong? Or did she just have a nasty phone call from her sister that you don't know about? Second, you have the option to do something about it, to help her shift her mood, if you know what is really going on. This goes the same for things that might improve your quality of life. Perhaps you assume there's no way to get a ticket to the rock concert at this late date, or that you'll never be accepted into the arts program, or that you can't afford that antique buffet that would look great in the dining room. It's so much simpler just to ask. Check it out, using phrases such as, I'm wondering if, and, Would it be okay if, and, Are you feeling, and, is there a possibility of getting, and, what do I have to do in order to, and, what would have to happen for you to be able to, and so on. Do you mean... Another way to check out assumptions is to use a technique I teach in my couples training sessions that can help improve communication in your relationships. I call it the Do You Mean Technique. Let's say that my wife asks me to help her clean out the garage on Saturday. No, I say. Now my wife could instantly assume, Jack's mad at me. He doesn't care about my needs. He doesn't care that my car no longer fits in the garage, and so on. But with the do you mean technique, she assumes nothing but asks what I'm really thinking instead. Jack, do you mean that you're not ever going to help me with this task? That you want me to do it all myself? No, I don't mean that. Do you mean that you'd rather be doing something else? No, I don't mean that either. Do you mean that you're busy Saturday and you have something else planned that I don't know about? Yes, that's exactly what I mean. I'm sorry I hadn't told you yet. It slipped my mind. Sometimes people don't immediately tell the reasons behind their answers. They just say no with no explanation for their position. Men are more likely to respond like this, whereas women will often give you all kinds of reasons why their answer is no. Men more often will just give you the bottom line, not the details. Asking, do you mean, will get you a lot more clarity, so that you aren't left wondering what is really going on. Checking it out contributes to your success. Checking out your assumptions improves your communication, your relationships, your quality of life, and most especially your success and productivity in the workplace. You start getting better results. You don't show up with missing parts. You don't make assumptions about what people were going to do that they didn't do. Whenever you have the inkling that Barbara's not going to finish that on time, you call Barbara. You check it out. W. Edwards Deming the brilliant systems expert who helped post-World War II Japan manufacture automobiles, electronics, and other goods better than almost any other country on the planet, once said the first 15% of any project is the most important. That is where you need to get clear, gather data, check things out. For example, when you get into a business relationship, you determine in the beginning, in the first 15%, how you'll work together how you'll resolve conflicts, what the exit strategy is if someone wants to leave, what the criteria are for determining if one of the people is not living up to his or her side of the bargain, and so on. Most of the conflicts that arise later in relationships are because people made erroneous assumptions without checking them out. They failed to get clear up front on their agreements. Space Between the Rules of course, the 15% rule also applies to any personal goal you might pursue as well. Remember best-selling author Tim Ferriss, who once won the National Kickboxing Championship with just six weeks of training? The story behind that story is that he didn't assume anything about the rules of kickboxing, but instead checked them out thoroughly. He learned from his research that if you threw your opponent out of the ring twice in one round, you won the match. 
Now, in kickboxing, most people think of kicking and boxing. Ferris, on the other hand, was a wrestler by training. So he told his coach, Don't teach me how to knock someone out. Teach me how to throw my opponent out of the ring while not getting knocked out myself. That's how he won the championship. He determined the difference between what the rules actually were and what people assumed the rules were. In life, there are a lot of instances where there is space to maneuver between the rules. If you don't ask and simply assume you can't accomplish something, it may be that you could have easily succeeded through some loophole or other hidden fact that is revealed only when you research it, when you check it out. Principle 53. Practice Uncommon Appreciation. There is more hunger for love and appreciation in this world than for bread. Mother Teresa, winner of the Nobel Peace Prize. I have yet to find a man, however exalted his station, who did not do better work and put forth greater effort under a spirit of approval than under a spirit of criticism. Charles M. Schwab, first president of the U.S. Steel Corporation. A recent management study revealed that 46% of employees leaving a company do so because they feel underappreciated. 61% said their bosses don't place much importance on them as people, and 88% said they do not receive acknowledgement for the work they do. I've never known anyone to complain about receiving too much positive feedback, have you? In fact, just the opposite is true. Whether you are an entrepreneur, manager, teacher, parent, coach, or simply a friend, if you want to be successful with other people, you must master the art of appreciation. Consider this. Every year, a management consultant firm conducts a survey with 200 companies on the subject of what motivates employees. When given a list of 10 possible things that would most motivate them, the employees always list appreciation as the number one motivator. When asked to rank order that same list, the managers and supervisors ranked appreciation number eight. This is a major mismatch. The Five Languages of Love and Appreciation We have found that each person has a primary and secondary language of appreciation. Our primary language communicates more deeply to us than the others. Although we will accept appreciation in all five languages, we will not feel truly encouraged unless the message is communicated through our primary language. Gary Chapman and Paul White, co-authors of The Five Languages of Appreciation in the Workplace. When I wrote the first edition of this book in 2005, I talked about how it was valuable to make a distinction between three kinds of appreciation, auditory, visual, and kinesthetic. These are the three different ways the brain takes in information, and everybody has a dominant type they prefer. Auditory people need to hear it, visual people need to see it, and kinesthetic people need to feel it. For example, if you give visual feedback to an auditory person, it doesn't have the same effect as verbal feedback. The auditory person might say, He sends me letters, cards, and emails, but he never takes the time to pick up the phone or walk over here and tell me face to face. Visual people, on the other hand, like to receive something they can see, and perhaps even tape to their cubicle, put on their bulletin board, or hang on their refrigerator. They feel appreciated when they receive letters, cards, certificates of appreciation, plaques, trophies, pictures, and gifts. Things they can see that will help keep the memory of it around forever. You can usually tell these people by their walls, bulletin boards, and refrigerators. They are covered with reminders that they are loved and appreciated. Kinesthetic people need to feel it. A hug, a handshake, a high five, a pat on the back, a back rub, going for a walk together, going out dancing, or taking time to play a sport together. While the auditory, visual, kinesthetic distinction is a useful one, relationship counselor Gary Chapman has created a model of the five love languages 
that is a very useful further refinement of how people need different forms of communication to feel fully appreciated and loved. Chapman first noted the importance of this distinction in his work with couples, but has evolved it to include communicating with children, adult children, teenagers, people in the military, and people at work. What are the five love languages? Words of Affirmation If this is someone's primary love language, they feel most cared for when you are open and expressive in telling them how wonderful you think they are, how much you appreciate them and what they do, and sharing words of encouragement expressing your belief in their talents and abilities. Quality Time If someone's love language is quality time, they need you to be fully present and engaged with them when you are talking with them or engaging in the activity at hand, no matter how trivial. While my wife, Inga, is a very kinesthetic person, she majored in physical education, was a massage therapist and a physical trainer, taught skiing and yoga, and loves to go hiking, swimming in the ocean, body surfing, and dancing. Her primary love language is quality time, not physical touch, as I originally thought. When I am with her, she wants my full attention with the TV off, not looking at my computer or my iPhone, giving her full eye contact and actively listening and responding to what she is saying. When she returns from a session with her spiritual teacher, she always comments on how present he is, how deeply he listens to her, and how much she feels seen and heard by him. She loves to sit by our pool and have long conversations. She loves to go on long walks together with me or one of her close friends, and she can easily spend an hour on the phone with her sister talking about family members. Receiving Gifts If someone's primary love language is receiving gifts, you need to give them a gift for them to feel loved and appreciated. Daddy, what did you bring me? Receiving gifts is the primary love language of Patty Aubrey, the president of the Canfield Training Group. If I bring her back a gift from one of my travels, she knows that I was thinking about her and took the time to buy her something meaningful. It can be as simple as a bottle of melatonin when I learned she was having trouble sleeping at night, or a case of Kirin Free, her favorite non-alcoholic beer, that I learned about when we were eating lunch at Nobu, a Japanese restaurant in Malibu. Or it can be as expensive as the Rolex watch I bought her when we sold one of our companies that she helped build. Acts of Service If someone's love language is acts of service, doing something for them makes them feel appreciated. It could be watching the kids so they can go to the gym, washing the dishes without being asked, bringing them breakfast in bed, running an errand for them, or volunteering to help them out on a project. Physical Touch This love language is just like it sounds. A warm hug, a kiss, snuggling, holding hands, a massage, and sexual intimacy will make them feel most loved. In the work setting, an appropriate hug, a firm handshake, a pat on the back, a high five, a fist bump, or a one-minute shoulder massage works. I have also given gift certificates for pedicures and foot massages to staff and friends whose love language is physical touch. One of the key things to remember with all of this is that your own primary love language may not be the primary love language of the person you want to appreciate. If you appreciate someone in the wrong language, whether it is your wife or daughter at home, or an employee or co-worker at work. It is like speaking French to a person who speaks only Chinese. The message doesn't get through. Also remember that everyone has a secondary love language as well. While my primary love language is physical touch, I also respond to words of affirmation and gifts. Inga also loves acts of service, and my business partner Patty also loves words of affirmation. So if you want to be a real pro at delivering uncommon appreciation, you'll want to learn which kind of feedback makes the most impact on the person to whom you are delivering it. Here are three quick ways to help you determine someone else's love language. 1. Observe the other person's behavior around others. 
One of the easiest ways to determine a person's love language is to watch how they interact with others. Most people speak in their own love language, so how they behave offers clues as to what's most important to them. How do they respond in a social setting? Are they a hugger? If so, then physical touch could be their primary language. Are they always the first one to give a compliment? In that case, words of affirmation may be their love language. Look for patterns. 2. Listen to what they most often complain about. The things that bother them about other people are important clues. If they say, My husband went on a vacation and didn't bring anything back for me. Or if they brighten up every time they receive a gift, then receiving gifts might be their primary love language. 3. Pay attention to their requests. Listen to what they ask of you. People will often reveal their love language through little hints, like saying, Bring me home a surprise from your business trip. Give me a hug. Or, I need you to turn off the TV when I'm talking to you. At some level, I think we all like to receive gifts, acts of kindness, and words of affirmation. But if words of affirmation is not your primary language, it won't register as deeply as your primary one. So, as with all things, you have to experiment to see what works. Hang in there until you get it right. I once took a couple's workshop with Dr. Harville Hendricks, the co-author of Getting the Love You Want, A Guide for Couples, in which he told the story about learning exactly how his wife wanted to be told she was loved and appreciated. Because she always gave other people flowers as gifts of appreciation, he figured that was what she would also want, so one day he sent her a dozen roses. When he came home from work, he was expecting to get what he called his reward, a big gracious thank you from his wife. When he walked in, she didn't even mention it. When he asked her if she had received the roses, she said yes. Didn't you like them? he asked. Not particularly. I don't understand. You always give other people flowers. I thought you loved flowers. Not really that much. Well, what do you like to get? Cards, she replied. Okay, he thought. So the next day he went to the card store and bought her a huge, oversized Snoopy card with a funny inscription inside and placed it where she would find it during the day. That night, when he came home, he was once again expecting his reward. No reward. He was so disappointed, he asked, Did you find the card? Yes. Did you like it? Not really. Well, why not? I thought you liked to get cards. I do, but not funny cards. I like the kind of cards that you get at the art museums that have a piece of beautiful art on the front, and then a really sweet and romantic message on the inside. Okay. The next day he went to the Metropolitan Museum of Art and bought a beautiful card and wrote a sweet, romantic inscription on the inside. The next day he placed it where his wife would find it. When he returned home, she met him at the door and smothered him with kisses and appreciation for the perfect card. Out of his commitment to make sure that she knew he loved her, he finally found the perfect medium for his message. Appreciation as a Secret of Success Another important reason for being in a state of appreciation as often as possible is that when you are in such a state, you are in one of the highest vibrational, emotional states possible. When you are in a state of appreciation and gratitude, you are in a state of abundance. You are appreciating what you have instead of focusing on and complaining about what you don't have. Your focus is on what you have received, and you always get more of what you focus on. Because the law of attraction states that like energy attracts like energy, you will attract more abundance, more to be thankful for. It becomes an upward spiraling process of ever-increasing abundance that just keeps getting better and better. Think about it. The more grateful people are for the gifts we give them, the more inclined we are to give them more gifts. Their gratitude and appreciation reinforces our giving. 
The same principle holds as true on a universal and spiritual level as it does on an interpersonal level. Keeping Score When I first learned about the power of appreciation, it made total sense to me. However, it was still something that I forgot to do. I hadn't yet turned it into a habit. A valuable technique that I employed to help me lock in this new habit was to carry a 3 by 5 card in my pocket all day, and every time I acknowledged and appreciated someone, I would place a check mark on the card. I would not allow myself to go to bed until I had appreciated ten people. If it was late in the evening and I didn't have ten check marks, I would appreciate my wife and children. I would send an email to several staff people, or I would write a letter to my mother or my stepfather. I did whatever it took until it became an unconscious habit. I did this every single day for six months, until I no longer needed to carry the card to remind me. With today's technology, you can also set up reminders in your smartphone or computer calendar, anything that keeps you on track. Take time to appreciate yourself, too. David Cass Stevens, formerly of the Dallas Morning News, tells a story about Frank Szymanski, a Notre Dame center in the 1940s, who had been called as a witness in a civil suit in South Bend, Indiana. Are you on the Notre Dame football team this year? The judge asked. Yes, Your Honor. What position? Center, Your Honor. How good a center? Szymanski squirmed in his seat, but finally said, Sir, I'm the best center Notre Dame has ever had. Coach Frank Leahy, who was in the courtroom, was surprised. Szymanski had always been modest and unassuming. So when the proceedings were over, he took Szymanski aside and asked why he had made such a statement. Szymanski blushed. I hated to do it, Coach, he said. But after all, I was under oath. I want you to be under oath for the rest of your life and own the magnificent being you are, the positive qualities you have, and the wonderful accomplishments you have achieved. Principle 54. Keep your agreements. Your life works to the degree you keep your agreements. Werner Erhardt, founder of EST Training and the Landmark Forum. Never promise more than you can perform. Publilius Cyrus, a Latin writer of maxims in the first century B.C. It used to be that one's word was one's bond. Agreements were made and kept with a minimum of fanfare. People thought carefully about whether they could deliver on their promises before agreeing to anything. It was that important. Today, keeping one's agreements seems to be a hit-or-miss affair. The High Cost of Not Keeping Your Agreements In my seminars, I ask participants to agree to a list of 15 ground rules that include things like being on time, sitting in a different chair after every break, and no alcoholic beverages until after the training is over. If they will not agree to play by the ground rules, I do not allow them to take the training. I even have them sign a form in their workbook that says, I agree to keep all these guidelines and ground rules. On the morning of the third day, I ask everyone who has broken one of the ground rules to stand up. We then look at what we can learn from the experience. What becomes apparent is how casually we give our word, and then how casually we break it. But what's even more interesting is that most people know they are going to break at least one of the guidelines before agreeing to them, and yet they agree to them anyway. Why? Most people want to avoid the discomfort of questioning, challenging, and asking for an exception to the rules. They don't want to be the focus of attention. They don't want to risk confrontation of any kind. Others want to take the training without really following, challenging, or asking for an exception to the rules. So they appear to agree, but they don't really intend to follow through. The real problem is not that people give and break their word so easily. It's that they don't realize the psychological cost of doing so. When you don't keep your agreements, you pay both external and internal costs. You lose trust, respect, and credibility with others, your family, your friends, your colleagues, 
and your customers. And you create messes in your own life and in the lives of those who depend on you for getting things done, whether it's showing up on time to leave for the movies, getting a report done on time, delivering needed parts to a customer, or cleaning the garage. After a few weeks of not following through on your promise to take the kids to the park on the weekend, they begin not to trust you to keep your word. They realize they can't count on you. You lose authority with them. Your relationship deteriorates. The same thing happens in business. Every agreement you make is with yourself. More important, every agreement you make is ultimately with yourself. Even when you are making an agreement with someone else, your brain hears it and registers it as a commitment. You are making an agreement with yourself to do something, and when you don't follow through, you learn to distrust yourself. The result is a loss of self-esteem, self-respect, and self-confidence. You lose faith in your ability to produce a result, and you weaken your sense of integrity. Let's say that you tell your spouse you're going to get up at 6.30 in the morning and exercise before going to work. But after three days of hitting the snooze alarm, your brain knows better than to trust you. Of course, you may think sleeping late is no big deal, but to your subconscious mind, it is a very big deal. When you don't do what you say you will, you create confusion and self-doubt. You undermine your sense of personal power. It's ultimately not worth it. Your integrity and self-esteem are worth more than a million dollars. When you realize how important your integrity and self-esteem really are, you will stop making casual agreements just to get someone off your back. You won't sell your self-esteem for monetary approval. You won't make agreements you don't intend to keep. You will make fewer agreements, and you will do whatever it takes to keep them. To illustrate this in my seminars, I ask attendees, if you knew you would get a million dollars if you made it to the end of the seminar without breaking one ground rule, could you have done it? Most agree that they could have. Often there is still one holdout who says, no way, I just couldn't do it. I'm not responsible for the traffic jam I encountered on the way to the seminar this morning. Or, how am I supposed to be on time when my ride was late picking me up? I then ask, what if the person whom you love most in the world would have to die if you didn't keep all the ground rules for this training? Would you have done anything differently then? Now the person who says the traffic made them late finally gets it and acknowledges, oh, yes, if my son's life were at stake, I wouldn't even have left this room. I would have slept on the floor in the conference room rather than take the risk of being late. Once you realize how important keeping your word is, you realize you have the ability to do it. It's simply a matter of realizing the cost of not keeping your word. If you want more self-esteem, self-confidence, self-respect, personal power, mental clarity, and energy, then you'll make keeping your word more important. If you want to have the respect and trust of others, which is critical to accomplishing anything big and important in life, including making a million dollars, then you will take keeping your agreements more seriously. Some Tips on Making and Keeping Agreements Here are some tips for making fewer agreements and for keeping the ones you make. 1. Make only agreements that you intend to keep. Take a few seconds before making an agreement to see if it is really what you want to do. Check in with yourself. How does your body feel about it? Don't make an agreement just because you are looking for someone's approval. If you do, you'll find yourself breaking these commitments and ultimately losing their approval. 2. Write down all the agreements you make. Use a calendar, daily planning book, notebook, smartphone, tablet, or computer to record all your agreements. In the course of a week, you might enter into dozens of agreements. One of the big reasons we don't keep our agreements is that with the daily press of all our activities, we forget many of the agreements that we have made. Write them down and then review your list every day. As I have stated before, a new finding from brain research is that when we don't write something down or make some effort to store it in long-term memory, 
the memory can be lost in as little as 37 seconds. You may have great intentions, but if you forgot to do what you agreed to do, the result is the same as your choosing not to keep your agreements. 3. Communicate any broken agreement at the first appropriate time. As soon as you know you're going to have a broken agreement, your car won't start, you're caught in traffic, your child is sick, your babysitter can't make it, your computer crashes. Notify the other person as soon as possible, and then renegotiate the agreement. This demonstrates respect for others' time and their needs. It gives them time to reschedule, replan, make other arrangements, and limit any potential damage. If the first appropriate time is after the fact, still let them know that you have a broken agreement. Clean up any consequences and decide whether to recommit to the agreement. 4. Learn to say no more often. Give yourself time to think it over before making any new agreements. I used to write the word no in yellow highlighter on all my calendar pages as a way to remind myself to really consider what else I would have to give up or not give my attention to if I said yes to something new. It made me pause and think before I added another commitment to my life. The Rules of the Game One of the most powerful trainings I ever took was Money and You, created by Marshall Thurber and now run by D.C. Cordova of Accelerated Business Schools. It radically changed how I related to money, business, and relationships. Everything you want to accomplish requires relationships with your friends, family, staff, vendors, coaches, bosses, board of directors, clients, customers, partners, associates, students, teachers, audience, fans, and others. For those relationships to work, you need to set up what my friend John Asaroff calls the rules of engagement. What Marshall Thurber, D.C. Cordova, and other folks at Accelerated Business Schools call the rules of the game. How are we going to play together? What are the ground rules and guidelines for the relationship going to be? Marshall taught us the following guidelines, which I have endeavored to live by ever since. If you and all the people you interacted with were to agree to the following rules, your level of success would soar. 1. Be willing to support our purpose, values, rules, and goals. 2. Speak with good purpose. If it doesn't serve, don't say it. No making people wrong, justifying, or defending. 3. If you disagree or do not understand, ask clarifying questions. Don't make the other person wrong. 4. Make only agreements you are willing and intend to keep. 5. If you can't keep an agreement, communicate as soon as practical to the appropriate person. Clear up any broken agreement at the first appropriate opportunity. 6. When something is not working, first look to the system for corrections, and then propose a system-based solution to the person who can do something about it. 7. Be responsible. No blaming, no defending, no justifying, and no shaming. If you're not early, you're late. One of the implied agreements in our culture is to be on time. It is an expression of respect. More people have lost credibility, trust, sales, business, jobs, money, and even relationships because of being late. Anthony Bourdain famed chef, host of CNN's Anthony Bourdain, Parts Unknown, and author of Kitchen Confidential, had a mentor who was a no-nonsense bully, yenta, sadist, and mensch, named Bigfoot, who had a rule in his kitchen, arrive fifteen minutes early for your shift. The first time Anthony was only fourteen minutes early, he was advised that the next time it happened, he would be sent home and lose the shift. And the next time after that, he'd be fired. Anthony was never late again for any job, and he instituted the same policy in his own legendary kitchens. Remember, if you're not early, you're late. So make sure to plan an adequate amount of time to get ready, leave, and travel to whatever appointments, commitments, meetings, and jobs you have.
Being on time is one of the most important habits you can develop for success. Upping the ante If you really want to up the ante in terms of keeping your commitments to yourself, you can use this technique that Martin Root taught me. Set up consequences, such as writing a large check to a person or an organization that you don't like, or shaving off all of your hair, that are greater than the payoffs you get for not keeping your word, such as the comfort and safety of not taking a risk. The cost of having to deliver on the consequences would be too expensive not to follow through on the commitment. Martin used this technique to motivate himself to follow through on his commitment to learn how to dive off a diving board. To make sure that he wouldn't back out of his commitment, he declared to his friends that if he didn't learn to dive by a certain date, he would write a check for $1,000 to the Ku Klux Klan. Because Martin is Jewish, that would have been more painful than confronting his fear of diving. So, as challenging as it was for him, Martin learned how to dive. What is so important in your life that you don't want to give yourself an out? Make a public declaration of a consequence that you would find painful to pay, and you'll use the power of motivating yourself to take the action that you say you want to take, but on which you have been procrastinating.